Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Fine Arts Podcast. It is wonderful to be back in the Melbourne studio today, Owen. Yes, it is indeed. We are talking how to get rich because there was recently an airing on Netflix of a show by the same name. Yes, How to Get Rich with Ramit Sethi. Yes. Uh, Netflix TV show. I think it's it's, yeah. it's a good excuse to talk about something we've been watching on Netflix that has something to do with your lives and to do with money. And there's a lot to learn from this show, I think. Yeah. he uh, it the, the show, just as a general gist, like profiles a bunch of different people, their relationship with money. It talks about there's couples in there, there's singles, older, younger people, all different yeah. types. It's super American. But yeah. I think there's a lot of insights to get from it. I agree with a lot of what he says. He has some good points. There's some more discussable points. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of named after his book, I Will Teach You How to Be Rich. Also has a podcast. Yeah. And he's got a podcast where he talks to couples about their relationship and money and all of those issues as well, which I know people in our community have been listening to. Yeah, absolutely. We... Um we deal with a lot of the things that Ramit talks to on this series each and every week here on the podcast, but it's good to hear how someone else deals with it. He's actually a money coach, so we do have money coaches in Australia, but due to the regulation, it's very hard for them to actually be money coaches uh, in practice. So uh, this was a really good insight, not just, as you said, very American, like the way it, you know what we're talking about the way they think, the way they act uh, with money and all this type of thing. But there's a lot of good takeaways, which we'll get to in a moment. We figured we might just play a snippet for those of you that haven't uh, seen the show. Uh, we'll just play a snippet or come through the audio. Uh, standard Netflix intro. intro. <laughs> Classic sound. When you hear the word rich, what comes to mind for you? Being able to do what you want to do without stressing over money. Money controls us. The numbers matter, always. I don't want to feel guilty when I'm spending my money. I definitely spend a minimum of a half a million a year in shopping. It causes fights in our relationship. The more money she's made... And actually, this first one, life. Kate, is... That, that's a bit of a snippet for the, I guess, the trailer or the intro to the, the series. Um, that first one is actually really interesting because the female in that relationship earns more money than the male. Mm. And the conflict that that causes in the relationship is really interesting. Yeah. And people in the series, they've never talked about money in their relationship before. And so it can be a point of conflict. And it, I think that is one of the fascinating bits that I enjoyed watching from mm. the show. Like most of the principles are simple, like our listeners will have heard of these principles before, but actually seeing how couples talk about money or don't talk about it and how they work out what are their shared goals, what are the goals that might not be shared and how they can come to some sort of alignment there. And he also talks about the theme of understanding your rich life a lot throughout the series. And uh, he describes this on his website as your rich life is your ideal life, one where you look at your personal relationships, your finances and your ordinary days and say, wow. It's a life that is full, a life lived intentionally, proactively, and abundantly. And we've discussed his idea of money dials on the show before, where you spend less on the areas of your life that don't bring you that much joy and you really turn up the dial and spend more on the things that you love. For example, fishing, Owen. Yes. Yeah, the dial is actually a very common um, technique used in by most coaches, and it doesn't always apply to money. Um there's, and there's like the, the wheel of life as well, which some people will be familiar with, which is where you basically have like five, eight or 10 categories in a wheel. And you kind of go around the wheel and you draw a line to rate how full mm. you are in that aspect of your life. So it might be relationships, money, et cetera. Uh, and I guess some of the big picture things that I took away from the series is, well, there's two things. Just, I guess, which, which, which we'll talk about in a minute, this idea of a rich life Um but aside from that, I think the first thing is how he prompted couples to think collectively. So 
He basically, whether it's a single or a couple, he said, just look at your bank statement. And we talk about this with Drew a bit, where you do a retrospective budget, meaning that you look backwards to look forwards. Whereas a lot of people say, I'm going to save 20% of my income from this magical day forward, not yeah. knowing that like your entire history is not based on that. And, and the other thing was that this, in, I th what I took away from all of this, and I think this is the, the, the essence of why we exist as well, is everything that he talked about has basically very little to do with money. And it's all to do with a relationship or like someone's relationship, by, by that I mean like their relationship with other people or their relationship with money in the world. And that was that's probably the most profound thing that I took away. What about you? Yeah. And it's interesting on that point, he actually talks to some of their family members as well and some of their friends. Mm. So you get to see that wider picture of someone's relationship with money. Of course, it's a TV show and people will change what they say and do for, for sure. that. But I did think that one of my big takeaways is when he, before he, went to meet each person, he would actually pull up some of their statements and you would get yeah. to, he'd have a quick look through and try to figure out who that person is just based off what he could see in their spending and their saving accounts and their investing accounts. And it gives you an insight into that person because we've talked about on the show, like the way you spend your money reflects your values often, yep. or maybe mm -hmm. the fact that you haven't thought about what they are and where you want to spend that money. And so he would look through someone's bank statement and go, okay, this is the kind of person I think they are. Looking at their brokerage account, are they in long-term investments or are they in a lot of short-term speculative companies? And that shows a different angle to that person. And another part I enjoyed was he actually took a serious look at multi-level marketing things like um, Arbonne. Yeah, yeah. There's her like well, there's Herbalife, and there are a few other yeah. multi-level marketing strategies out there. It's probably uh, it's it, it can be quite polarizing this debate when we start talking about MLM. Yeah, but he actually looks at the numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's actually, I think there's a separate Netflix series on that, actually, on multi-level marketing. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the things that like, was really interesting about this is he left people with homework as well. So in the meeting, he doesn't try and solve their problems. This is a, what a, a coach typically is action-oriented, whereas a psychologist would be introspective and let the person figure it out and just reflect for themselves. Yeah. Whereas he kind of set people homework and I thought that was really interesting in that, like, I'm going to come here and I'm going to push you, but also let you figure it out a mm. bit. Um, so it's kind of blending both together. Yeah. He never said this is your, the solution. You should sell the house or you yeah. should buy the house. It was more of a, you need to figure out what the numbers are and does it make sense and does it align with what you want in your life? Yeah. Just separately, did she say that she spent f half a million a year on shopping? Yeah, there was one woman who I don't think changed much about her life by the end of the series because the, <laughs> in the last episode they do a kind yeah. of a where are we now and they look at where each person has come and what they're doing with their money now and I think she was the one that was just sort of going along with her normal life. Yeah. There's a, there is a range of incomes and assets mm. in this show. So there's people that don't have that much and are in quite a substantial amount of credit card and student loan debt because that is – a massive issue over in America. And mm -hmm. there's some people that already came into this with quite a lot of money and just a few changes improved their scenario quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so, Kate, can you just talk to us about this idea of a rich life? Because he introduces the series um, as, like, I will teach you to be rich. Um, like That's the name of his book and everything. Like, can you describe what that actually means? Because I think this is the real misconception amongst everyone with money. I think what he really means is rich mentally because you could – it's that idea that Morgan Housel talks about of having enough money because a lot of people are not thinking about what they really want out of their life and how they want to use their money. So one couple in the show actually decide that they want to help their mother retire and stop working because she's worked hard to support them their entire lives and so that is their priority. And so how can they use their finances and pull their resources to achieve that? And yeah, he really pushes couples and individuals in the show to think about their values and where they want to spend their money and how to think bigger. Mm. So sometimes people approach money in a more limiting a way so that there's not going to be enough. I'm never going to have enough money to do any of these things. But he does push them to think a little bit bigger and go, okay, if you did earn a little bit more or you cut your spending in this area, what would the bigger version of this goal mean? Mm. So instead of just maybe like for you fishing one day a month, could you expand that goal and take a whole week to go if you 
change your spending a little bit. Mm, there'll be a few days of seasickness for sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are so many good things about the way he approaches it. And it basically all comes back to that. It's like, what's your version of your rich life? And uh, anyone can conjure this up. And if you remember, well, something we talk about a lot is the 10 things activity where we get yeah. you to list things down. Uh, that's basically our interpretation of Ramit's work. Um, and that's been that's helped probably hundreds, if not thousands, of people in Australia. So that's kind of the st- strategies that you get from the show. Um, we also, if you may remember, we did the uh, that remember we did the countdown, Kate, earlier this year in 2023 to count down, you know, all the topics that people wanted, but ended in like a vision board, mm-hmm. which is this idea of like this is the one thing that matters, and we ended it deliberately with that. So you could start building your own. And that is exactly what Ramit's getting at, is how do you design that life? And you find that most of the things have nothing to do with finance. So um, what else do we want to cover from the series? I think a big thing he talked about when he was discussing finances with everyone is how to change your finances so they don't keep you up at night. So whether that's paying down the debt or Mm. making sure you have a funded emergency fund or you're able to work a little bit less because you've got the money to support that. How can you manage your finances so you're not awake at night? And so one of uh, one of the individuals in the show had been sort of day trading yeah. of sorts. Great. And that was probably giving them a bit of stress and anxiety because the money was going up and down on a very regular basis in a brokerage account. And so that wasn't really improving their rich life because they had a day job. They didn't really have that much time to invest into looking at companies on a daily basis. So was that improving their overall financial picture? In this case, it it wasn't. So mm, Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so many interesting takeaways. I, I think the, the personalities were the most kind of like striking yeah, for me. The money and the relationships part. Yeah. I thought that was fascinating how people were talking about money together. Yeah. There's one of the things like when you make more money, um, I feel less valuable. That was the comment from the guy, wasn't it, in the relationship? Mm-hmm. Um, there was a young couple and uh, he, if I'm not mistaken, was living at home, like taking care of the house and earning less, but he previously earned more. Yeah, and taking care of the children yeah. as well. Yeah, and when he was working, they shared everything, but then when she started earning more, um, they didn't benefit mm-hmm. and she saw it as her money. Which is really interesting because yeah. I imagine that often happens the other way as well. When men yeah. earn, they think of it as their money. And further, uh, near the end of the series, there was a couple that was reverse where the, the the man was earning more than the woman. So you got to see it from both sides. Yeah. And in both circumstances, they felt that because they hadn't talked about it and what they want to spend their money and their collective goals, they felt that imbalance because they weren't contributing equally and that led to other issues. Yeah, bigger issues. And this is something that's very common in relationships. Like, how do you deal with when one person earns more than another? Like, for example, I might be com- com- comfortable that we split money equally. But you, for example, Kate, might be in a completely different situation where you think, well, we can split some of it equally, but some of it shouldn't be. So we can reflect mm. that. And that's the other one of the things Ramit suggested was if the income's quite lopsided, so someone's on $100,000 and someone's on $25,000 a year, maybe you shouldn't split all the bills and the payments 50-50. Maybe they should be split in proportion to your incomes. And that would mean both people have the opportunity to save and invest and work on their own financial Mm. future. Because um, there's, I guess there's always been the like, oh, just split split the bill. But should you if you're earning quite different amounts? Yeah. And I think this, this causes a lot of friction in couples. Like I see it everywhere. When we talk to people, for example, like, um, someone might earn, say, $250,000, have their own business and have been very successful in that. And then they find a new relationship and they work. They find someone who's earning 60000 in this instance and they're on PAYG because instead of starting a business, they maybe went and traveled, right? So then you have an imbalance because someone says, well, I didn't travel. I took the, the risk on my business and it succeeded. So I should benefit. And then the other person says, well, yes, um, but you know, I've not done anything wrong and we should be equals. But then the person that earns more says, well, I want to travel now. And the other person doesn't want to travel. So you see this like reflex- reflection all the time. Yeah. And it's quite challenging when that happens, especially if mm. someone's going into a relationship yeah. with quite a significant amount of debt and the other person maybe doesn't have any debt. And how do you actually talk about that and work out a plan that 
moves you both forward to whatever future you want together. Mm. I think we talked about this just you and I yesterday in the mm. chat where we say like, well, my opinion is that communication is like an absolute must. And this is not for finance. It's just in a relationship. That's like, mm. if you can't be honest with your partner, then, you know. But it's, it's tough because a lot of us have never had this money conversation with anybody, full stop. So oh, yeah. to have it for the first time with your partner, especially if you haven't spoken about it for many years. So some people, like it goes, they go years into the relationship before they start having this money conversation. Well, and, but what I mean, Kate, is it's also not just money, right? Like yeah. you have money, but a lot of, I'm going to single out the guys here, which I normally do, so sorry. But a lot of guys don't talk about their mental health. A lot of guys don't talk about stress and anxiety. Like I'd say 90 five percent 99 percent of the men that i've met don't yeah and when you think about that that's a massive point of insecurity that manifests with a money problem mm. but if you can't be honest with your significant other m- men and women if you can't be honest then my personal views is my personal view it can't work so communication is essential in a relationship to its for its survival but then you can't communicate if you can't communicate about life in general the chances of you being able to com- communicate about money are very low as well because there's even more anxiety built on top of it. And so if this is me speaking, communication is number one. And a lot of times what that happens is it makes f- people frustrated, question relationships. So I mentioned yesterday, patience is the second thing that's important because you have to be patient with the other person. Mm. And that's probably something that if during the TV show you're going to be watching it all in a day or two, but this actually happens over, I think, a course of six or 12 yeah. months that the couples are slowly working out how to talk about this, especially if they've never spoken about it before. You can see it's hard. You can see at times they don't want to have these conversations. And there's a lot of those unspoken beliefs and feelings and backstory mm. we have about money and things that tie into that. Because for some people, money is that sense of pride and security and worth. And if they're getting their worth from money, you can see how that causes a point of conflict when someone's earning less and they feel like they should be contributing more to the relationship. But Mm. I think it's important to value those other things. So people add different skills to a relationship. It's not just about that dollar amount coming in. Absolutely. Some people, it it, absolutely, Kate, I couldn't agree more. I was actually reminded of this quote that I shared the other night. Um, It's a one from Morgan House and it touches on what Ramit says in the show. I'm just going to try and bring it up. Uh, da, da, da. And you've heard this one before. Past a certain level of income, what you need is what sits below your ego. Uh, think of it like this. And one of the most powerful ways to increase your savings isn't to raise your income, but it's to raise your humility. That's from Morgan Housel. Um, and it talks on about some of the beliefs that we have. By earning more, we'll be wealthier. We'll yeah. be richer. We'll have a better life. Um, but maybe it's the other thing that we should be thinking about, that kind of hurdle that we put in front of us, the artificial hurdle. Mm. Um, so many of those. Yeah. And there, there was one other thing on sort of like the the beliefs and the relationships is it popped up a few times that the idea of the sunk cost fallacy, mm. the fact that I've spent so much time working on this or doing it one way, it's pointless to change now because I'd lose everything that I did in the past. But he was sort of saying, well, you can use that as a learning experience, take the skills, take the lessons from that. It might have been an expensive lesson. Sure, you might have lost some money, you might have lost some time, but what can you do now to move forwards in a better direction towards your Mm. ideal life or what you want to do with your money and your time? Because um, if you just stay doing the same thing, like one of the women who was uh, involved in a multi-level marketing activity was saying, well, I've spent so much time trying to make it work and I've invested so much energy into making it well, it wasn't quite a success, but she wanted it to be, I should just keep working at it. But he was saying, well, look, you've learned a lot of skills from this. You've learned public speaking. You've learned sales. You've learned all of this. Can you use that skill and apply that to a job that's going to pay you more so you can feel like you're contributing to the relationship so you can build your own financial future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, We see that in so many parts of life and uh, that's a great example. Um, Okay, so... Ramit has this idea of getting your money working for you. Um, and one of the things that jumped out to me was his, he had this idea of like, because when he would look through the statements, he would say things like, and then he'd talk to people and they'd be like, I need to own a property. I need to own a property. Mm. I need to own a property. And he really pushes back on that belief yeah. that you need to own a property to be successful. 
Yeah, he does. He says like if you put it in a spreadsheet, you can be wealthier without a property. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's different contexts around Australia and the US, different prices, different ways to save and invest and whatever. But that was a really interesting thing. And I think most people, um, like most professionals do challenge people on this. Yeah. And um, he goes, it might be right for you, but you need to know the numbers because a lot of us will rush in and we won't go... What is my body corporate? What are my council fees? What am I going to pay for water? What am I going to pay for mm. X, Y, Z? What am I? Have I got money to put aside for when things go wrong with the property, when there's a leak? And if you haven't done the numbers, you might think one option's a lot better than the other without having a serious look at, okay, is this a lifestyle decision? Is this an investment decision? Do the numbers make sense? Or if maybe if you'd be worse off owning a property versus renting, but you make that decision because it fits with your lifestyle and what you want. Yeah. And we see this in multiple ways, Kate. Like people rent vest where they own a house somewhere and then they rent an apartment in the place that they can't afford um, because it's a lifestyle they want. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many ways we can go with this. But one thing I'll bring up is um, it. I, I'd say that we've always said, well, I've always said this, is that um, the property that you own should be your lifestyle asset. So that's your first and most important consideration is what does it match your life? But the second thing is that if you rush to buy a home because you have this kind of like social pressure, like I need to own a home, if you rush that, it could be the worst mistake you ever mm. make financially in your entire life. Yeah. And there's a lot of social pr pressure with owning property. Like it is something that people get excited about when you tell them, when you put the post on Instagram. No one really gets excited for you if you tell them you bought $50,000 of IOZ ETF, the ASX 200 ETF, instead of buying a property. Like yeah. no one, no one's going to get around that except maybe us. No, no, no one will. Um, but I think like there is, so there's a huge lifestyle element, but there's a financial element as well. Um, and a lot of the social pressure that we get comes from the previous generation. Mm. Um, I would just say that there is an extreme downside to not owning a property. So the extreme downside is if you have a family and you have to move houses and we were speaking to mm. a friend of the show, Andrew Page, recently, I think he said something like he'd moved 12 times, uh, 10 times. He's in had like, a rough time. In like less than 15 years. Uh, he's got kids. Um, and so, but financially he made a lot of money from investing. Right, instead of mm. buying a house, or he sold his house actually. Um, so there are it's pretty interesting considerations, but one of the lines that Ramit has is your rent is the maximum you'll pay and your mortgage is the minimum. Now, I think that's a little bit nuanced. I think that's a bit too simplistic, um, but it's good that he pushes people on this belief because it's, it's a limiting money belief. Yeah. I, I think it's important that he actually asked that question because I have spoken to some people and they just. They have not run the numbers. They don't know how much their property is costing them. Yeah. The other one, um, it, he uh, he made a point about not paying percentage-based fees. Yeah. Yeah, which is I, th I agree with. I don't know yeah. about you. Like, oh, for fin financial advice. Yeah, for financial advice to pay a fixed fee. Yeah. I'd he say for most people, yes. Yeah, especially he was speaking to someone with quite a large sum of money already and he was saying, well, you don't need to just keep paying this annual fee. You could just get them to do the job implement it and then maybe you want to pay for an annual review but you don't need to pay a fixed percentage of your entire assets i think it was like one percent financial advice fee and that would be there would be other investment fees on top of that yeah yeah um the percentage fee yeah i mean it's very generous um <laughs> generous for the advisor yeah that's yes. what i mean yeah that, so, you're giving a lot <laughs> yeah I, I think it's it's good to question the fees and what you're getting out of advice yeah like you're a savvy consumer with everything else. You can ask questions about advice, what value you're getting, what service. If it is a percentage-based fee, well, are you getting ongoing service? Are you getting regular reviews and meetings? Is there more education? Maybe it is worth it to you, but you want to ask what you're getting for it. Yeah, and there, like, there are some reasons why percentage-based fees have to be in place for financial advice, for example. For example, if you want your financial advisor to manage your money for you, the only way they can do that in Australia is if you um, is if you go onto what we call a platform. So this is like Perla for advisors, right? And those platforms always charge percentage fees, so the advisor has no way around that mm -hmm. um, because they unless you want them to log into your Perla or Comsec or whatever account, 
every time there's a trade, yeah. they're going to charge you a lot. That has downsides as it's, well. Yeah, huge downsides. So, yeah. And I did like that he pushed people on the fact that investing should be boring and automated, which yeah. is something that we talk about a lot. It shouldn't be the most exciting part of your day. No, no. And you, for some people it is, right? But for yeah. most pe- pe- people it shouldn't be. Yeah, and the, the people in the show were just ordinary, everyday people in the most case, and they wanted to do things outside of money. They yep. wanted to actually live that life. And so he's very much just like, turn off your computer and get on with your life. Your your rich life is lived outside of the spreadsheet. So if you get too fixated on the numbers, you can forget to actually enjoy the life you're building. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Kate, let's leave people with a question. What is your rich life? I think that's a really good way for you to reflect right now. If you listen to this, what does your rich life look like? How can people think about that? Yeah. And what makes you get up every morning and go, wow, I love my life. Yeah. It's not always going to be amazing because life's never amazing at every single point. There's always going to be ups and downs, but you can look at it from a bird's eye view and go, I'm happy with my life. I'm happy with what I'm building. Even though I still have goals and things I'm working towards, I can be happy right now and I'm not postponing that to a future date. Yep. If you want to know how to do this, it sounds pretty overwhelming. If you want to know how to do this in practice, just take out a piece of paper or your your phone, get the notes app out and answer two questions. One, or it's not even a question, it's that can you just describe in a paragraph your perfect Tuesday? This is a working day for most people. And then just describe that from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, what are you doing? Same thing for a Saturday, which is typically a day off. What are you doing from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed? If you write that down, that will solve a lot of these things. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about that, we did Owen's vision board activity in our final episode in January of this Mm -hmm. year, but I'll link it in the show notes. And that also has a worksheet that you can fill in that sort of takes you through these steps to really work out what kind of life you want to build. How do you want to spend your time and money? Yeah. And have a watch of the show. Let us know what you think. Uh, you can send us a message or just at us on social media. Let us know what you think of the show on Netflix. Uh, yeah. It's great when we see more money shows around. Mm. I think it adds to the the conversation in a positive way, and mm. I think people get something out of watching it. It's definitely better than the other Netflix series, which was um, about like GameStop and stock trading <laughs> and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, this is definitely uh, probably less sexy, but it's definitely more valuable. So. Go and check it out, particularly if you're in a relationship. This might be something that you can use. Yeah, Um, just as a little thing in the background to provoke a few conversations. Yeah, or even understand your partner more and their relationship with money and how you want to live your life. Um, Some great strategies. So, Kate, this is good fun. How to Get Rich with the Meet Satie. It's on uh, Netflix. Go and check it out. Thanks for joining me. Wonderful. Thanks for listening, everyone.